Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Call Time Atlanta. I am really excited because I have a very special guest for you today. It's Keith Brooks, you know him from The Walking Dead, Drop Dead Diva, um, Swamp Murders. He has done television, film. He is an actor, singer, producer, and a writer. He's done opera, improv. Keith Brooks is so multi-talented, I'm completely jealous of him, but that's another story altogether. I just love having him as a guest because he is not only so talented and knowledgeable about the industry, but he's also very humble and very giving and just very genuine. And I think it's easy in this industry to get caught up in everything you need to learn and to know and kind of forget that it's all about giving and telling stories. And this is what Keith Brooks is all about. So I'm really excited to have him on the show today and share his insights with you. But before we get started, I need to thank a couple people. I want to thank Kyle Rollins of Mammoth Solutions. Mammoth Solutions is a digital marketing and branding agency, and you can find them online at mammoth.solutions. So hit them up for your marketing and branding needs. I also want to thank my friend and DP, JP Marston of Actor Taping Services, which is where I am right now and where we're going to shoot the interview. Just hit him up if you need auditions taped, if you need to record a podcast, if you have a show like this that you're doing. He's really great. He'll set you up. He'll turn around the work fast, and he's just great to work with. So find him online at actortapingservices.com. You can also find Actor Taping Services on Facebook. Just hit them up for all of your recording needs. <laughs> so let's get into the interview. Let's get started. I'm so excited to bring you Keith Brooks. We're live. Yay. Yay. Woo. Keith Brooks, Just... welcome to Call Time Atlanta. Right. I am Pamela Deritis, and I'm going to read a little bit from your bio here. You okay. are a professional actor, writer, director, Nunchaku enthusiast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're from Atlanta, Georgia. You have a bachelor's degree in theater from Barry College, mm -hmm. an MFA in acting from New York University and the Juilliard School, yes, and a bunch of other degrees that we probably don't care about. <laughs> Those are his words, not mine. <laughs> well, I care because I think your oh, background thanks. is fascinating. <laughs> thank you. Um, you have done improv. Your experience ranges from film to television, stage, stand up, voiceovers, opera. You've done composing, directing, yes, producing. I, I just like get dizzy reading everything that you. I mean, you've I'm bad at all of those things. I don't know. I don't know. Well, we'll find that out. <laughs> so you were recently on The Walking Dead. Yes, ma'am. Season four. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Magic: The Gathering, the musical, Swamp Murders, Drop Dead Diva, Faceless. And you can also be seen in the local Walgreens sugar-free candy section. Yeah. Always. So that is the. The bio, the short version of your bio. So talk about the nunchaku. Yeah, okay, this is my favorite question anyone's ever asked me. Because uh, I always put it on things and nobody ever talks about it. They just glance over, okay, he's weird. I, I uh, think it's fascinating. <laughs> well, it's, okay, so it's a long story. So in 2008, I got diagnosed with diabetes. I'm sorry, I'm making this a serious oh. uh, thing. But, uh, so in 2008, I got diagnosed with diabetes, and then I just needed um, some form of exercise. So I got really into martial arts. Oh. And uh, I was much bigger than I am. I'm big now, but I was like Louis Anderson size before. And so I uh, started doing like Brazilian jiu-jitsu and something called kabuto, which is basically karate with these 13 traditional Okinawan weapons. One of them is nunchaku. I'm a kid born in the 80s, so I love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and so that's really why I wanted to do it. And uh, I just found it to be so relaxing and so, uh, I, I don't know, I think you learn a lot from martial arts, mm -hmm. always. Especially with nunchucks, it's, it's this very, um, most martial arts are very stance and, and position and, and uh, sort of structure driven, right. but within that, when you're doing with nunchaku, you have, you know, two pieces of wood connected to a chain, and it was chaos within that structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just find that very inviting and relaxing. And I got to do a national nunchaku competition, and break oh, cool. sugar glass in the air. It was fun. Oh, I'm just a nerd. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> so most people would take up walking, yeah. maybe swimming, if they have to manage diabetes. I wanted to be a turtle. That's yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's amazing. So do you still do that? I do. I, not as much as I would like to, but I have a. I, Again, my nerdy aspect, if you walk into my apartment, there's a whole closet full of nunchucks, which is ridiculous. Interesting. Okay. So if I ever need anybody to defend me. I'm here for you anytime. <laughs> so can we see that online at all or uh, anywhere? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's the, the National Nunchuck Competition. There's a video of that somewhere. And then I made a short film uh, called 
Too Wong with Kung Fu, Thanks for Everything, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, <laughs> where I play an eight-year-old boy fighting with his six-year-old brother over a Blade Two action figure, and there's some nunchuck stuff in there, and it's okay. like a 1970s martial arts rip-off film, so it's pretty fun. So did you um, did you do a lot of improv for that, too? Uh, yeah, so some improv for it. Most of it was, uh, we, we tried to design the film to be, I, I co own a company called Bean Dip Productions, and so that was one of, uh, the first thing we ever shot, but we designed shot by shot to be like a 70s Shaw Brothers film mm -hmm. so it was very uh there's a lot of improv as far as the dialogue but then everything was very well choreographed and stuff. Yeah. okay so let's talk about your uh, we'll switch gears a little bit we're okay. going to talk about your education yes ma'am nyu and juilliard yes ma'am so did you go from one to the other um you... no so i'd gone from barry with a bachelor's degree and i wanted to further my education have a degree at the end of it and Juilliard's conservatory so it only offers certificates mm -hmm. but they have an adjunct program so that if I would go to NYU and supplement classes I could have a, a degree uh, a bond degree or whatever it's called mm -hmm. uh, from both schools uh, so, so I, that's how I got my master's was from that so. okay so did you what was your course of study there then um, well mostly just acting stuff and then I supplemented it with some like literature classes and uh, some different theory classes at NYU but mm -hmm. most of the time I spent at Juilliard so okay I'm just doing everything acting really yeah yeah so what techniques did you learn um well, Juilliard's really Probably big about a mix of yeah I mean it's, it's a lot about pluralism so you learn from you know uh, Meisner to Strasberg to Stella Adler, but also like Alexander Technique, you learn about classical theory, mm -hmm. so from Grecian to picking uh, opera, which is basically what their acting program is based on. Mm -hmm. um, so like it's just everywhere, but it, it teaches you the basic idea that there is no one path to artistry, right. that everybody can choose their own path and right. everything right. works, you know. Do you have a preference? No, I mean, I, I like that in itself, that idea of pluralism. Yeah. I think a lot of times as actors, we learn one technique and we're like, oh, this is the golden ticket. Mm -hmm. But you can also maybe find more about yourself, more about characters if you try to approach it from a different perspective. Right. Like I, I teach um, I teach classes at Rob Progo Studio in Marietta. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, my acting classes are very, based on that idea where like one week we'll talk exclusively about the Greeks mm -hmm. and learn everything we can about the original Greek acting Oh, ideas and so really and so I think each you know um, approach to that has like for example in Greece it was illegal to tell someone you're an actor because it was not about you it was about the story it was about the characters and so the idea of ego didn't exist so this whole concept of being a diva yeah. would not have existed in ancient Greece right wow. I think that's an important thing for I had not calling out names or anything, <laughs> but, um, I won't either <laughs> but, but I think you know every single section of history if, if we look at acting as sort of this uh, mosaic or a mural every culture that's come across or come about has like painted one stroke mm -hmm. so if we can look at all those strokes we can understand the picture better I think oh. and that's sort of my oh, that's acting. fascinating so when are your classes um whenever I'm free uh, okay. <laughs> no, normally it's like a Wednesday night 7 to 10 I charge like 10 bucks and yeah. come in just do three hours that's great Thanks. okay I may stop in then, <laughs> take some Greek classes. So how did you end up back in Atlanta from New York? Uh, yeah, so I, while I was going to school, I'm, <laughs> this is so weird, my job was writing rap. Um, <laughs> so I wrote hip hop for a long time and then, uh, through a series of circumstances, my mother got sick and she lives here, and I uh, had a job opportunity to write rap here. So I just came back to write rap, and then when I got back, I'm like, I don't want to write music anymore. I just want to do acting. That's what I spent all this money at school for, anyway. Yeah. So let me go do that. So that was. Sort How of... did you become involved in writing rap? It just seems <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head around all of the things that you do. Yeah, I'm, I'm a weird person. I'm sorry. <laughs> I I wrote. Uh, I worked in a lot of music studios before I left for New York. So when I still like when I was growing up, I, my first music studio job I think was like 15. I started doing engineering work and uh, session musician work. I uh, played a bunch of different instruments. And so through that process, I, I just got really into the music scene here for a while when I was still in high school. Yeah. Um, when I went to Barry, I worked at a recording studio there. And then, so when I was moving to New York, my initial thing was, oh, I need a job. Let me see what studios are hiring because that's what I was used to. Right. And then from that, I got signed to a label to be an assignment in a ghost song writer um, and then from that I was just making beats yeah no. that's great <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. let's go to opera for a second okay yeah <laughs> JP <laughs> do you see something funny there <laughs> just you two. Oh, okay um, opera 
Yeah. So what opera productions have you been in? I, I was in like four, and I'm terrible at it, but it's <laughs> Juilliard, we had to do it. So. Oh, okay. But, but it's, I mean, it's important, I think, for any actor to sort of step outside of their comfort zone, and that was definitely, like, I like singing. I just don't have the, the opera singers have a special technique and skill, and I just mm -hmm. don't possess that. Okay. Um, but I did uh, The Fleet of Mouse, I did um, Faust, and... One original, and I don't think it, I don't know what the other one was. Oh my God, my teachers are gonna hate me if they watch this. <laughs> um, but but it was it's a sort of thing. I mean, from opera comes operetta, from operetta comes musicals, and it's just a different technique of acting and style of acting that right. I think it's important for actors to try to experience because it's yeah. new. It's it's like going from you know theater to television for the first time. It's a completely different world, and right. the, the the concept is the same, but the the techniques and the tactics you use to get a story across are a little bit different. And so, so can you elaborate on that? Because I've yeah. done theater and mm -hmm. I've done film, yeah, and so I know the difference between those two. But I I love opera, but I have no idea what goes into an opera production. Well, I think it's uh, the same way that you would do. Uh, okay, so in, in generic broad strokes, when you're telling a story and it's just you by yourself, it's very different than when you're telling a story amidst a scene, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with opera, you have to... It's almost the uh, suspension of disbelief that these characters are larger than life, you know what I mean? Right. And, and so your voice has to fill your entire body and your body has to fill the entire story. Yeah. So these operatic characters are designed to be epic and so you have to carry yourself like you're running a marathon the entire time. Uh, Especially with just the lung capacity that you have to have to deliver these things. Right. Plus I think telling a story through song, emoting through song, mm -hmm. is a different skill set than telling it through words, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, lyrics versus, you know, actual dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a different thing to learn. The same way I would equate it to learning to cheat yourself open on stage as opposed to, right. and then with the broad strokes of acting, as right. opposed to being, you know, all here for camera. Right. Um, and so I think opera is the same sort of, it's, it's a, just a different skill set. Um, and, and to me, it's very interesting to try to push yourself to be able to emote through a melody and finding the nuances in that, and especially since operatic singing is so stylized as opposed to regular singing as right. well. Right, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Interesting. So I was going to ask you if you could sing something for us. I'm terrible. I'm ter <laughs> but if you're not comfortable with that, then no, I won't. I'll, I'll, sing, I'll sing something at the end, maybe. We'll see. Okay. <laughs> maybe at the end. After we've gotten more into the groove. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. So all of these things that you do. Yes, ma'am. Acting, producting, directing, composing, like I said, all these different things. How do you stay focused? I mean, it's... It, so Drugs. The, that's not true. That's yeah. not true. That's <laughs> hey, not. if it is, then you know, that's, that's your thing. So one of the things that um, that has been hammered into me in my entrepreneurial work, mm -hmm. not so much in acting, but as an entrepreneur, um, is focus, focus, focus. And don't spread yourself too thin because then you don't get good at one thing. Yeah. And you don't serve your audience if you're not great at that thing. So I'm not saying the exact thing applies to the arts. Yeah. But... It does. Like, how do you how do you focus? How do you move forward in your career? And well, where do you want to take your career? Well, I think a lot of people will tell you that the same thing applies to the arts. But I think a lot of people are also just uh, what's that word? Haters. Um, <laughs> no, I think I think it's uh, to to me, do whatever strikes your fancy, mm. and, and stay focused on that. Like I, uh, my rule of thumb has always been be interested in what you're doing. And if you're interested in what you're doing, it will see you through the process. Yeah. So, and sometimes it becomes out of necessity. I, I opened up a production, me and my uh, Trevor Garner opened up a production company because for a time we weren't getting parts. So if no one else is casting us, we're gonna make our own movies. Mm -hmm. And then that proved to be successful. Mm -hmm. And so we you know, went to a lot of film festivals, did Sundance, did a bunch of awards and stuff like that. But it was because it came from the necessity of well, we're not doing anything else, right. but we wanna stay busy, you know? Right. Um, What's the name of the company? Bean Dip Productions, oh, which is a really yeah, silly name. That. Yeah, <laughs> that's Bean Dip anyways. Productions. Yeah. Is that still going? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. So, so we still um, we have a, a contract with Netflix right now. We just did a feature for them and, and sort of Wonderful. stuff like that. Thank you very much. But, but to me, it's like 
and from that, like a lot of things are born out of necessity, but but you find yourself being interested in them or, or finding a new skill set that you didn't know you could tap into. Yeah. And that's always exciting. Yeah. So to realize, oh, this is scary to me at first, but oh, wait, maybe if I do this, oh, I'm learning about this as I'm going mm-hmm. along. That's neat. That's, you know. Crazy. I think every actor, they weren't Brad Pitt when they first started, you know? Mm-hmm. They, we all had those first couple moments on stage or on screen where we were uncomfortable and we didn't feel right in our skin, but yeah. the more you do it, the more you grow. And I think when people tell you to just focus on one thing, they're doubting the potential that you have, which you hmm. should always believe in your own potential. But that's just my optimistic Oprah-esque comment of the day. <laughs> well, that, that is, that's great, and that does kind of fly in the face of a lot of what I've heard, again, in the business world, not so yeah. much in the arts, but it sounds like you are focusing on your one thing as you're doing it, but you're not making that the be-all and end-all of your career. Yeah, I yeah. agree. But then I also think to also focus on the one thing always, but make that one thing more grandiose than one specific craft. Like, if you focus on... If you're producing a film, it's almost impossible to focus on one thing. So right. instead, you focus on the film itself. You focus on the story as a large perspective. Mm-hmm. And that enables you to do the producing, the directing, the editing, writing, acting, or whatever. Because everything you're doing is for the sake of that story, as right. opposed to you know, making millions. Right. Which, which would be nice if that happened. Right. But still, that's... <laughs> would be nice. But... <laughs> so are you self-taught, then, in all of these different endeavors? Um, Acting-wise and directing, I those took are, classes and stuff like right. that. Right, you went to school for those, but yeah, yeah. as far as everything else... Uh, for the most production. part, I mean, like, production-wise, yeah, definitely. Um, as a writer, I've been writing ever since I was a kid, and took a lot of creative writing classes. Editing, I, I did, like, a, a couple of gigs in college where I had, like, a public access TV show and stuff, mm-hmm. so I had to learn to edit on the fly, but I had some great mentors help me out mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. Um, everything else, I'm just winging it and see what sticks, you know, yeah. <laughs> sort of... Yeah. My thing. So speaking of mentors, do you have, are there specific people in the entertainment industry or other actors maybe or, uh, you know, other types of people in the entertainment industry that you consider your mentor or that you look up to? Oh, yeah, there are tons of people that I look up to as far as, I I don't know if I would necessarily say that I have a mentor specifically, but I I definitely have actors that I have my acting crushes on. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, like, I look at other people's work, whether they're, like, large-scale, like, Vincent D'Onofrio, I'll watch anything that man's in. Michael J. Fox just gives me a warm spot in my heart. Mm -hmm. Nev Campbell I have a massive, like, real crush on. (laughs) But um, but there's actors in this town, like Mark Ashworth, April Billingsley, you know, Prago. Mm -hmm. Um, All these people just do amazing work always. And seeing people do amazing work sort of inspires me to want to do the same. I want to make sure I'm on that level you know etc etc so what does acting mean for you in your life i know oh, that's a deep one uh, i think switch gears yeah no, that's good that's good <laughs> i think it's catharsis but i think it's also a drive like they tell the story of um Thespis, we all know the classical story of Thespis, like, walking out from across the boundary. And before that, everyone had to stay behind this line. And then in, in Grecian, uh, you know, context at the time, a thespian wasn't described as an actor, but it was a person like Thespis. But the, the subtext there was it, was it was a rebel. Mm-hmm. It was a person that had to do something because they felt a compulsion to do it. Mm-hmm. They had a fire burning inside of them. And to me, that's what acting is. It's mm-hmm. this fire. I have to tell a story. Yeah. And... I'm going to get it out one way or another, and acting is just an avenue where I can use myself from head to toe to mm-hmm. do that, you know? And so I, I feel that it is a drive and um, what I was born to do, I think. I know that sounds really, you know, blah, but still. No, I, I don't think so. I think that if you find your purpose in life, you are fortunate. A yeah. lot of people never okay. find that. So, okay. no, it doesn't sound woo-woo at all. Um, <laughs> so it, kind of coattailing on that, though, I... When I was doing my research on you, yes, ma'am. Um, stalking your house, sitting yeah. outside your driveway. It was lovely to have so, <laughs> Watching you in the shower. Um, <laughs> when I was doing my research, I, you play roles, you have played some roles that are real kind of dirtbags. Oh, yeah. Oh, and um, <laughs> for lack of a better word, <laughs> I'm not saying that's your entire career, obviously. It but, is. It is <laughs> my entire career. So what about, the, how does that fit in with your overall compulsion to tell these stories is it do you not mind playing those roles do you enjoy those roles Uh, do you um um, you know what i'm saying yeah i I think it's i enjoy telling stories and i enjoy challenges Mm -hmm. so a lot of times i'll get these roles 
that either I know they're going to be dirtbags or I, I'm surprised the last day and find out I'm going to be a dirtbag. <laughs> um, but either way, it's sort of saying, hey, can you fit this? Can, can you make this work? And I, I want to be able to say, yes, I can make this work and I can make it work differently than anything I've done before. Mm -hmm. So I want people to be able to look at my dirtbag roles and say, well, that dirtbag's very different than this dirtbag. Than the other dirtbag you know, over there. You know okay. what I mean? How do you do that? Uh, I think it's trying to distance yourself from who you have been and tap into different parts of yourself, to tap into different parts of your psyche or approach the character in different ways. So uh, I'm trying to think of how to say without being... Uh, so, so like, um, so Walking Dead people, like if you're watching on the, the iPad Samsung thing, um, <laughs> like my Walking Dead character was a, a pedophile, right, right? Which is definitely not who I am by any means. Like, I don't like shaking people's hands. I get so nervous, much less anything else. Anyway, so... Uh, I had to type, tap into some element of like sexuality that I, I don't normally play with as far as characters. I had to be somebody that wants power and nothing more than power. Mm -hmm. So searching for that, I sort of became this wild dog. And that's how I found that character, was putting my psyche into a very different place. Mm -hmm. but then I played this dirtbag recently on the show, uh, Snap Killer Post, which is some like oxygen thing. and. Um, on that, I made the character much more uh, manipulative, and, and it was more from a, a logical standpoint, you know what I mean? It was more about thinking three steps ahead and trying to get what he wants as opposed to trying to force himself on other people and take things from other people. The one was more about convincing you, and you know, it was more cerebral than, than visceral. Right. You know? And so, so trying to make those distinctions between the characters, I mm -hmm. think, is always a good thing, too. I don't know if that answers the question. I, think yeah. I, was, just, I was just mumbling. I don't know what I said yeah. in the last five No, minutes. well, the reason I ask <laughs> is because I do meet some people, not often, but um, I have met some people, and sometimes I struggle with this myself as an actor, of, of being emotionally challenged playing certain roles. I'm trying to think yeah. of how to say it. I, I will, you know, do pretty much almost any role, I guess, within reason. some boundaries, yeah. but... But there are parts of yourself that you have to tap into that are ugly. Yeah, and, and dirty. And, and dirty and um, immoral. And I do know some people who just won't go there. There are parts that are really hard to walk away from. I, and yeah. I think it's hard to, I think as actors, part of, as artists in general, part of what we do is showing people I think the obligation is to show people the full spectrum of possibilities that humanity is capable of, right? Yeah. And so I did this part once where I played this schizophrenic mob boss, right? And my mother has schizophrenia. So I was very aware of that. I knew they had these schizophrenic simulation tapes where it just sort of like you play them in a dark room and it gets you in that sort of zone. So I did that for like three weeks wow. just to get myself in the zone. But then I found myself going to Best Buy and cussing people out when they asked me if I needed help. And I'm like, oh, I have to stop this. This wow. is getting, it's like wow. getting to me, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, not not saying that people with schizophrenia cuss people at Best Buy. My mom does, but not everyone. <laughs> um, but that's sort of like sometimes you you tap into that area, mm -hmm. and it's you could argue that it's better for the craft that it helps you express yourself in a way that you wouldn't have been able to before. Yeah. But then, what's the cost it gives you uh, as a person? Right. Well, how much of a toll does it take on you? Right. And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. But yeah. it's it's a fair balance in line that I think you have to walk. So. You just made a statement that I always think about when I'm acting and about portraying all of what humanity is capable of. Yeah. And I like to think that the acting profession as a whole is valuable to society and moves helps move society forward, but we do portray a lot of ugliness oh, yeah. about the human race. So, how do you feel about that? How do you do you think it's worth actors or the entertainment industry delving so deeply into the darker side of humanity? Do you think that's worthwhile? I do, because I think it shows humanity themselves. I mean, Shakespeare often said that theater was a mirror, that, that we hold the mirror up to the audience so they can see what they're doing themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think as vast and wild as our imaginations are, our imaginations are not so creative that we're inventing things out of the thin air. Mm -hmm. We're we're tapping into things that actually do happen that that we do have the potential of doing. Right. And it's no, not so far-fetched, and I think it's important for society to see that. There's this great 
thing of, of Walt Disney, um, he was making Bambi, right? And, and it was sort of his symbolic representation of World War II. And he had the animators hide swastikas in the fire that's consuming the, the forest. And the animators turn to Walt Disney and they're like, hey, are you sure we should be doing this? And Walt Disney says, yes, because A, stylistically it's what I want, and B, if someone sees it, they need to know that this should never happen again. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing that art can do, oh, right? And yeah. so... I think as artists, whether you're a songwriter, director, musician, uh, you know, actor, poet, whatever, I think part of our obligation is to either A, show ourselves, mm -hmm. or B, show people themselves, mm -hmm. you know? Interesting. Yeah, I, I struggle with that. It's, um, yeah, I just struggle with that. Personally, I guess maybe maybe I worry about it too much, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I yeah. think it's, it's something to totally... I think you can... Uh, okay, so the, again, the Walking Dead thing, just because that's a you know, mm. people on Periscope might know it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's a it was a very violent scene, and it was a very rough scene that I had to do, and it sort of took me a long time to overcome it. And like even when I went home, I couldn't look at things without thinking about it, you know. And like in, in my mind, I was doing something that I would never do as a human, as a person, yeah. but other people would. And and it was important for the sake of the story. It was important for the people to see that, to see the depravity that we're all capable of, you know? Mm -hmm. I do think at the end, as long as you can walk away and say it's important, even though you might have the heebie-jeebies, yeah. you've still done your job, you know? Yeah. yeah. So do you want to play more of those types of roles? Not necessarily <laughs> not necessarily the one on Walking Dead, but yeah, yeah. just more of the darker... I'll, I'll play anything. Like, I, I, I again, I, I welcome the challenge. Like, mm -hmm. I, I went straight from that to... Uh, Constantine to doing a stripper clown on some show. Stripper clown? <laughs> yeah, Balto and Mr. Lockjaw available on, I think, <laughs> Vimeo, Hulu, something like that. Uh, so, yeah. So. Uh, I did not find that in my research. <laughs> yeah. It was a wonderful stripper Boy, clown. I gotta step it up. I did not know about the stripper clown. <laughs> but that's the thing, is, is if I can do voiceovers for, like, for puppet things and then be a stripper clown and then be I don't know, George Washington. I've shown the range of right. what I'm capable of. And so every role is not only challenging myself, but it's also broadening myself. Mm -hmm. I learn new things with everything I do, and, mm -hmm. and hopefully it increases my worth as a person. Mm -hmm. I know, it's weird. Have you had any roles that you really felt strongly about um, that you really identified with? I think every role that you do, or every role that I do, I identify with a part of it, or I aspire to be a part of it. So it's hard for me to say, like, the last thing I did, I'm producing and um, working on the Star Trek fan film that's pretty big right now, right? Mm -hmm. And so I played a captain in that, and this guy was, like, super brave. And I didn't necessarily identify with his bravery, but I wanted his bravery. I wanted to be as commanding and powerful as he was. Mm -hmm. And so that was cool for me to do, and then... Um, but and then, you know, the role before that, I was in this short called Redneck Zombies, where I was just a, well, a redneck who became a zombie. It's pretty self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but I identified with his, in the, in the most negative way possible, I identified it with his sloth and his laziness, you know. So I, I think you identify or or inspired by portions and parts of these characters, yeah. you know. I think that's how I work. Do you not see yourself as brave in your personal life? I think I do, but in a very different. I, I, I'm not. I'm, I'm neurotic to the extent where I'm like the diabetic Woody Allen. Uh, I'm just like, oh, riding motorcycles is difficult. I don't know if I could do that. Um, but I, I, I see myself in brave in certain scenarios. I, I'm brave when I have no other option but to be that. But I'm not brave as in. I can never do what uh, the amazing people in the military do. I just don't have that function. They're, they're much more honorable and brave than I am, you know? Mm. And, I, and I aspire to be like them in that, in that sort of sense of self-sacrifice. Uh, but I think we all have moments where we step up to courage and all have moments where we fall short of that. Mm -hmm. And this character I played is named Captain David Jelland, right? And I just... He seemed like the sort of man that, no matter what the obstacle was, he had no doubt that he would come across on the other side. Where me, as a person, I filled with doubt all the time. Mm -hmm. Especially like, especially in a business like acting or entertainment, you're mm -hmm. always being told no yeah. every single Constantly. day. And so it's hard not to doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. But every now and then, I would want the courage of Captain Jellin to be like, it's fine, you told me no. I'm not going to cry and eat Cheetos all day. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> and I'm gonna not that I would ever thing. do that. Yeah, never, never. <laughs> More of a Pringles man. That's not true. <laughs> Cheetos all the way. <laughs> but you know, that sort of thing. Well, I would argue, though, that maybe 
those people that you aspire to be more like, but wouldn't have the bravery to go inside themselves like you have for your roles. Thank you. That's a nice thing to say. It, it's really, you know, it, it's... Maybe I understand it more because I am an actor and mm -hmm. I've had to do the same, not to the extent that you have, but you face these dark places in yourself that people in everyday life push aside or push down or ignore. And this is not brought out in polite society. You know, in day-to-day -day yeah. life, we are all a certain way with each other and that's kind of the unspoken rules that we all abide by. Yeah. Um, but to go inside yourself and tap into these really dark places, not many people would have the guts to do that, I think. Thank so you have that's something nice. that maybe they would aspire to as well. That's nice of you to say. That's... I'm being sincere in that. I appreciate that. That's super sweet. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> so, okay, let's let's talk a little bit about the industry in Atlanta. Yes, ma'am. And how long have you been here? Uh, 2011. So, okay. so you, you came recently. Yeah. How have you seen, I guess it's, you know, it's going to be a short time, but how have you seen the industry evolving in the time that you have been here? Oh, it's radical, it's the changes that have occurred. Even it's, since 2011? Yeah, yeah, even since then it's been sort of insane how things have just sort of blown up. Like it started from everybody being weakened, at least in the circles I was in, everyone was a weekend warrior trying to shoot their film for nothing, and now right. everybody's aspiring to have every single department represented, and, mm -hmm. and, and just, I mean, the studio uh, environment involvement here has now become insane and, and massive. Like the first audition I had when I got here, might be a little bit before 2011, um, but was for The Walking Dead for the first season. Mm. And uh, and it was still like a, no, a nothing show. It's just something that Robert Kirkman did in Marietta, right? And so now the fact that they do tours um, uh, of the, the uh, nowhere near where they're shooting now, but they do tours in Atlanta. Like, hey, here's a road they shot on. Like, right. oh, that's okay, right. cool. You yeah. can also see that by driving, you know. Right. But, um, <laughs> but but now that this Marvel's here, Disney's here now, and right. it, it's insane. The studios that are opening up. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, so what do you see as the future of the industry? You think the growth, the rapid growth, is going to continue? Do you? Yeah, I think it'll change the entire infrastructure of Atlanta. I mean, completely. I think it's going to be something where more studio involvement, more you know, bigger budget productions are happening here, mm -hmm. and it's going to be great for opportunity. There's going to be so much more happening, and I, and I think the cool thing that I think I've seen is that this major influx of mainstream media has also inspired independent media. Mm -hmm. um, if we have more business here, we'll have more camera rental locations, we'll have more green screen locations, right. we'll have more acting studios. Post-production. Post-production, mm -hmm. all that will flourish. Yeah. So hopefully within that flourishment, more of those places will be more, uh, will still be catering and kind to independent productions because I do think that's the the backbone of an artistic scene, an artistic society, with the people that are just going out and doing it themselves. Right. Uh, as long as you have that somewhere, mm -hmm. then it, it has it leaves room for artistic growth and development. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because there is still sort of a wall when it comes to mainstream media that that you have to be. The, the, most productions here are still looking for LA talent above Atlanta talent. Right. I think slowly that's changing. Yeah. But still, while that exists, yeah. the Atlanta talent needs a place to have training wheels right. and that's I think always going to be independent and I think that's not just the land of any community yeah yeah so, so what uh, advice would you have for the Atlanta talent that is up and coming yeah and they are competing with the influx of talent from Hollywood or yeah. productions that want to bring talent from Hollywood here what what can you tell people I would say just uh, just do it just just go make something, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I, I think the more we perceive it as a competition between the LA talent, which I think at a base level it is, mm -hmm. but the more you perceive that as it, the more you're gonna get discouraged by it. Yeah. So let your work speak for you. And if, if you're not getting work, to me, it, I, I give this advice because it's what I did, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's great. Don't do everything I did. Diabetes <laughs> isn't the greatest of diseases, so don't get that, <laughs> you know, for example. But Get go something on. else. Get something else. A different diving. disease, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but go out and just create material and let that work. Like, learn from it. Every project you do, you should be learning from. There's a great George Harrison quote, with every mistake, we must surely be learning. Mm -hmm. um, so go out there and make movies that are good, make movies that suck, make <laughs> crappy TV series, try hand porn. I don't care. Whatever you want to do, just go out there and 
create content and from every single step along the way you'll learn more about yourself as a person and as an artist and by the time it comes your chance to be in the big movies mm -hmm you'll have no idea of competition in your head. It, it won't be about that. It'll right. be like, my talent speaks for itself. Right, right. Um, so. so another th thing that just came to mind from my entrepreneurial life is that um, one of my, the people that I look up to in that world said something along the lines of, if you're not embarrassed by your early work, then you didn't get it out to the world soon enough. Yeah, agreed completely. And I think that's true for actors too. Yeah. I think, you know, I have work out there JP was on a production with me where I look at some of the footage from that and I'm like, boy, I did not know how to act. <laughs> boy, I was a shitty actress. <laughs> Let's hope it never comes to life. But, you know, the, my recent, more recent work, I can look at what I do and, and I may pick apart certain things, but I'm, I'm more confident in my work now. Yeah. So I think you're right. It's so important to get your work out there even if you're embarrassed by it, maybe especially yeah. if you're embarrassed by it, yeah. because that means you're getting it out there quickly enough. Yeah, and I think um, people can be cruel, but yep. some criticism is always a good thing, mm -hmm. um, because it lets you know that you're not perfect. I think the one of the problems with a budding acting scene is all actors think they're impervious, they think they're ready for it, but yeah. I don't think any actor is really ready for it, yeah. ever, because it, the it always comes with so many more things than you ever expected it to come with, right? right. And so, like, even today, like, I don't watch anything I'm in because I can't stand looking at myself, like, not in a very deprecating, I mean, it is partially in that Woody Allen deprecating way, <laughs> but mostly because I, I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna criticize myself because I have so much more places to grow, right? And so I try to grow in privacy and not watch myself on screen or anything like that but anyway um, but yeah I, I think you should always just put yourself out there and, and, and see what the results are see how you feel about it mm -hmm. because even as your own worst critic that criticism can help you learn what you're doing wrong learn the places for improvement etc cetera, etc cetera, right. you know yeah absolutely so would you change anything about the Atlanta industry if you were Pulling the strings. I would move Nev Campbell here, and uh, no. Uh, Get Edward Norton while you're at it. Okay, yes, ma'am. We'll, we'll do. We'll do. Uh, I think he's in town, though, isn't he? He's doing his he Lewis town? and Clark thing. Oh my God! Why was I stalking you I'm when so, Ed Norton was so, here? So sorry. Oh, I just got thrown away really quickly. <laughs> That's it. Um, <laughs> Uh, oh, I don't man. know. I'm a bitch. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're awesome. Man. Uh, I, I would pass me up for Edward Norton. Too. <laughs> he, he was the Incredible Hulk uh, a couple movies ago. So, um, I I don't know what I would change in Atlanta. I don't think I don't think anything needs to change. Yeah. I think I think it's it's growing. I think it's in its infancy, but it'll yeah. get to a place that's nice and sustainable. Yeah. And anything I would change, it'll change in time regardless. On so, its own. Yeah. Just as a progression of the evolution and the industry here. Yeah, and I think that's the mirror of art. Like you can try to force something into being something, but if you let it go organically, you I think you're generally going to be pleasantly surprised with the yeah. outcome. Mhm. Mm Great. So. so you are also Mm -hmm. Among many other things, you are a judge in the Marietta International Film Festival. Yes, ma'am. I was this past this past yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. So, what kinds of films did you see coming in? Were they first of all were they mostly local or or I guess well no it's international. Yeah. Let me start that question again. Now I feel dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, people on Periscope. We're gonna edit that part out. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> you are also a judge in the Marietta International Film Festival. Yes, ma'am, I am. Thank you for that question. Imagine the first that. Time. <laughs> and, uh, how did I know that? So, what kinds of films did you see coming through? Uh, and what do you look for in a film when you judge it? Uh, I judge everything. No, that's not true. Um, You're so judgy. I am so judgmental. <laughs> um, I, we, all sorts of films. So we saw a lot of shorts, a lot of features. Um, some of them local you know, uh, a lot of them abroad, mostly in the United States. Um, I look for something fun. Not, it doesn't have to be fun as in like, oh, Mickey Mouse is on a bobsled. Not that sort of fun necessarily, but just something that, that's cohesive and that it, it and that's my definition of fun. If I can have fun watching it, mm -hmm. even if it's a depressing movie and I'm crying my eyes out, mm -hmm. if you've got me to cry my eyes out, then it's a fun experience because you've constructed a story well, you know? Right. And so I'm looking for people utilizing their craft to the best of their abilities. And I think when you watch, especially um, an independent film, you can see what the best of their abilities is. I know that probably sounds weird, but that's uh, sort of what I'm looking for. Someone that puts together a piece nicely and, and for the purpose of 
serving the story as opposed to look how amazing my shots are even mm -hmm. though we don't have any dialogue and the story's about right. a potato right. you know <laughs> like i want um Potatoes are good, though. Potatoes are good, and I would love to see a film about a potato with some interesting, like, dolly shots, maybe, if you want. That's fine with me. Um, but I want more of, like, a cohesive project that just sort of has its own tonality, its own voice. It has its own, you know, yeah. purpose. Yeah. Now, do you still do a lot of improv? I do. Okay. I do. Well, I mean, I don't do, well, I say I do. I, do, I don't do any more improv. I did, like, a bunch of improv troops and stuff like that. Right. Now I just imp improvise on film sets and make directors hate me and writers pissed off but I do that a lot <laughs> that's great though I, I you know as I'm talking to you I'm just like yeah I can see where the improv is coming <laughs> in and you seem to be very strong at it so. oh, thank you very much yeah um do you find that you ever get any pushback if you try and or do improv on set oh, I sometimes I try to feel out the set yeah so I try to like put one word in at a time and then like okay okay I got my four words in now <laughs> let me just go off and do a monologue and see yeah. what they say <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and is it usually well received? Or? Most of the time, I mean, I think it's, yeah, most of the time. Uh, some some sets are very strict about the dialogue, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. um, but but I think you can also again feel that you know right. feel that coming out and. Uh, and sometimes I think if, if a script is really well written, there's no, not saying that, all, you know, I think a script is really well written, there's no need to improvise. Mm -hmm. um, and but some scripts can be really well written, but just something comes up in the moment, you right. know, sort of thing. So I think it's all playing it by ear in case by case scenario. So. Now, where did you learn improv? I started doing improv at, I did like a, a class at Dad's Garage when I was like 17. And then when I went to college at Barry, I did um, uh, Easy Bake Improv. And then when I went to New York, I was in Hammercats, which is the NYU program. And then I was in Upright Citizens Brigade. And okay. so I did those. And then, uh, yeah, just Great. burned out on improv games after a while. And then decided to write about improv for a while. And then yeah. came back to Georgia. Yeah, yeah. writing rap. Yeah. What's, um, what do you find challenging about improv? Well, I think it is that ultimate challenge acceptance. It, it's that yes and mm -hmm. um, that is so, I think, important to actors in general. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you just have to go with the moment. I think the most challenging thing about improv is trying to make it work with a person that doesn't understand how improv works. Uh, uh, that's the most challenging specific thing ever. Right. But I think uh, the, the brilliance of the concept is to have no preconceived I'm uh, sorry, preconceived notions of where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. And just let the scene be that chaos within the structure that right. we were talking about as far as like nunchucks and stuff. Right. Let improv be nunchucks, guys. That's what you need to be. Um, <laughs> improv equals nunchucks. Yeah. Uh, so you you don't perform improv right now? No, not right There's now. There's no place we can just, go see Just you. in my life. I guess. <laughs> and I'd love to see you on stage. <laughs> Thank you. That would just be so fun. Um, so, uh, well, that's all the questions I had here. But... Is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I could that you think that I maybe didn't cover that we can? Your hair looks really nice today. Thank you. I got it done a couple days ago. Did you? Would you, would you get your hair done? Where? Yeah. Van Michael Salon. <laughs> Van, Did you like prefer Van, Van Michael Salon over any other salon? Is that your favorite? It's salon? It's the only one I've been to in Atlanta. Only one. Since only I one. moved here in 2008. Somebody told me to go there, so I went to the New Talent side. Yeah. And then the girl, one of the girls that I used on the New Talent side, moved over to the regular side, and I followed her over there. And she's very good, and I love her. Now, I don't, now as, a, as a man that has terrible hair, I don't understand what the New Talent side and the regular side is. Could you explain oh, that to the viewers? Yes. So, viewer, this is very important, so you have to listen. I'm only going to say it once. The regular side is the professional, like, they've been doing this for years, they've been through all the training, they know what they're doing, and the new talents are um, up-and-comers. So they recently got into the salon, they're training, they cost less. Don't uh, go there before a hot date is what you're saying. No, actually, I, they, they all do the same, they all do wonderful work. I, I would say it's a budgetary decision whether you oh, okay. want to. Yeah. You go there too, don't you? Yeah, JP? but not to the new talents. Right. No, you're... Well, I'm on the regular side, too, now, JP. I've caught up to you in life. <laughs> so, so, can I ask where you moved uh, here from? So I'm from Rochester, New York. Oh, that's fantastic. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I came here in 2008. Okay, gotcha. Very yeah. cool. New York yeah. all the way, all the way. Very different aspects of New York that we lived in, but yeah. It's... Well, I spent um, a couple of years... I think I was telling Mike this when he was here for his episode, mm -hmm. Mike Panuski. Um... I spent two years going to New York City every weekend oh. for some dance stuff that I did. Oh, that's awesome. So I got to know the city very well, and it was like my second home for a couple of years. That's and fantastic. I love it. And I can see myself being up there 
It's beautiful. Again. It's beautiful. And plus, it, it is the city that never sleeps. Yes. Everything's always going on. Yeah. Like, hey, it's 4 a.m. I want Ethiopian food. Well, yeah. do you want Ethiopian you fusion it. or regular right. Ethiopian? <laughs> like, it's weird. So, can, can I ask you about the dance stuff? I'm sorry I'm interviewing you now. Do the, oh, okay. We're turning it around now. Okay. Um, <laughs> dance. I Well, going to New York City, I started going there for swing dancing. I was on a swing dancing team. That's Lindy fantastic. Hop. Yeah, okay. I am a big Lindy Hopper. I've been doing it for a long, long time, and I love it. Um... I still do it, socially. Like, yeah. I don't perform anymore, but I was going there for performing. While I was there, I met up with a Broadway performer who is a tap dancer, and I started learning tap from him. Uh -huh. So I was doing both of those things for a long time. Then when the swing dance team was done, I continued on with the tap dance instructor. And I also do salsa dancing. I was on a performance team here in Atlanta. Oh, here in Atlanta. What was the name of the salsa team? Is it still? Uh, it, no, it's it's oh, oh, it's over. It was no. the Ana Lorente ladies team. Ana Lorente is a is a salsa dancer, and she's wonderful. She does competitions, and she's like That's world cool. class. And yeah, she put together this ladies team for a season, and we performed in a few venues, um, including at the Fruit and Bank. That was cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So I do that, and like I do like ballet, but I'm not a ballerina. I'm really bad at it. I do it for the training. Yeah. So, but because it helps my other dancing. Yeah, and plus, like yeah. fifth position is very calming to me. That's what I always like. Uh, I have no turnout at all. It's no. Just, oh, I just want to like slap people who have really good turnout because I don't. <laughs> but I don't slap them. I just envy them, and that's where it ends. <laughs> I had to play. Uh, I played football in high school, and then we had to do the ballet classes. Oh like, yeah. Sort of thing. yeah. And yeah. so I, I did the ballet, and like just found like, oh, this is really relaxing. Like, and all the other football players would be like, Keith, what are you? I'm like, no, it's it's good. I like this position. It makes me happy. It's, <laughs> My happy uh, place. Yeah. So, do you prefer dancing or acting? Uh, that's a good question. Dancing to me gives me an inner peace that I don't find with anything else. Oh, what to be a honest. beautiful way to describe it. It really does. I, you know, I've gone through some very difficult times in my life, and all I could think, all I can think about when I think of dancing is, even through those difficult times, as soon as I get on the dance floor and I'm with a partner and connecting with a partner, it all goes away. It's mm. like I, I enter this other world, and I know it sounds kind of woo-woo a little bit, but um, just just moving your body to music, even if you're not the greatest at it, there's something transcendental about it. I agree completely. What a great way to describe it. Yeah. I, I think that most artists that have multi-talented or multifaceted sort of lifestyles yeah. have one art that they reserve more for themselves. Yeah. And this becomes more personal for yes. them. Yes, and that's dancing for me. Yeah. Even just going social dancing, you know, yeah. I just lose track of time and lose a sense of myself when I'm out there. Well, there's something so freeing about the idea of dancing, of like mm -hmm. just letting the music take you and yeah. just... Yeah. You know, just surrendering to something yeah. it's so inviting I think it is yeah. it is and and how can I describe it this is more true of obviously of partner dances but when you get a partner that you really connect well with mm -hmm. it's like everybody else fades away around you and it's you're focused just, yeah you're focused and you're, you're moving as one unit and even if you're following so you don't know exactly what's coming next but if you if you're a, a follower that can you know follow follower that can follow um if you're an experienced follower is what i was trying to say mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that you don't know what's coming it, it's it's just a delightful surprise every moment yeah yeah i think that's the way i think that's the nature of art especially when you're working with other people if you're truly doing it if you're truly giving into it and that surrender mm -hmm. it's welcoming what happens next and, and being ready to just see where the ride takes you yeah. and i feel that way that's when scenes work the best is when yeah, you're just giving exactly. in to somebody that's yes. when music works the best if we're just riding on each other yeah and, and um that's when whistles work the best and we're all just like yeah <laughs> whistles yeah <laughs> that was probably my email sorry about oh, that no 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 it's it 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 a lovely noise i like it a lot so uh any more questions for me <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry no that's fine that's fine i I haven't had guests interview me, so that is quite all right. Um, so, when are you, what are you going to sing for me? Oh God, uh, I don't. Oh God, um, <laughs> I'll sing. I do this. Okay, so I go to like conventions a lot, and uh, 
for the Walking Dead stuff primarily, um, and to make people think I'm not really a child rapist in real life, I sing Disney songs, which might not be the best choice. Oh, that might that might come off as creepy. <laughs> yeah. Isn't well, that the guy from The Walking Dead? And why is he singing right? Disney songs to everyone? But I charge people a dollar, so I feel like so I'm, I'll sing a Disney song for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll sing. What can I sing? Hercules. Can I, can I sing Hercules for you? You can okay. sing whatever you like. Okay. <laughs> um, music has always been my sort of personal yeah. thing, but it, with songs I write, not with Walt Disney songs, I guess. Okay. Um, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. <laughs> oh God! It's like I've never been in front of a camera before. Um, let me. I'm gonna stand up. Sorry. I feel like I've screwed it up already. Can I stand up? I'm just gonna. You do what just, you need. Yes, ma'am. I, okay. I can move out of the way. No, you're fine. I love you. You're, you're inspiring me. Okay. okay. I'm right here for you. Okay. I'm gonna start again because I felt I was bad with that. I have often dreamed. Of a far off place where a great warm welcome will be waiting there for me. Where the crowds will cheer when they see my face. And a voice keeps saying, This is where you're meant to be. I am on my way. I can go the distance. I'll be there someday. If I can keep strong, I know every mile will be worth the while. I would go most anywhere to feel like I belong. That was rough. That was rough, but that's crazy. That was so rough. Oh Sorry. Don't ever say you can't sing again, or I will come and find you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, you know where I shower now. So I, don't, I don't know where to shower. <laughs> Keith Brooks, thank you so much. Thank you for much. having me. Thank you for coming. You. This is fantastic. Thank you. I had a wonderful time. Thank you for having me. Hi, yeah. Periscope. Thank you. <laughs> I loved having you here, and I hope you come back. Yes, ma'am. Anytime you'd like me to. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, JP. Thanks, JP. <laughs>